What's going on, everybody? This is Randall Mars, the founder of HBC Pulse and the host of HBC Pulse Radio here on Sirius XM in the building for a very special edition of the show on today where we're talking about media and mass communications. We got to talk about it. So I had to bring in an expert, a deal maker, someone that's making it happen in the industry. I had to bring in Akila Friend in the building. How you doing today, Akila? I'm doing so well. So glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Most definitely. We have to have these conversations because I know that for me, I graduated from Fort Valley State University as a media studies graduate in fall 2019. And I know for me, we always talked about what the future will look like and, and what we're going to be doing. And a lot of us, to be honest, we were doing our coursework, but we were uncertain. So I think that, you know, these these conversations have to happen because we've been hearing a lot of people talk about Oh, like media is an easy major. Oh, it's not like you're being a doctor. So we got to have these conversations because media literacy in the media is important. But before we get to that, it's Founders Day coming up for you. You are a woman of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. So first and foremost, how are you feeling going into Founders Day? I'm feeling washed. <laughs> I feel good. Oh, I feel washed. <laughs> I feel like, you know, I'm definitely older. Um, I joined fall 12, um, junior year. Of, of undergrad, um, love my sorority, love my line sisters, but all the time when Founders Day happens, when our, you know, anniversary happens, anything of that nature, I'm always like, oh my gosh, where is the time going? But still such an illustrious organization to be a part of, and, and I'm blessed to really cross paths with not only the women of, uh, fellow women of AKA, but also D9 in general. Like, this is just, I feel like the month of January is a, is a you know, refresher in terms of, like, why I wanted to be an AKA to begin with, why I wanted to be a part of D9 to begin with too. So all good. So let's talk about your, your college experience. So you did not go to an HBCU, but no. I think that your viewpoint is important because it's going to show like sort of the differences. So uh, talk to us about your college journey and, you know, what institution you attended and also talk to us about, yeah, like, you know, your, your higher education experience in general, like, you know, your other degrees, different things like that. Sure. Sure. So for me, um, and this may be a story, I think less and less people as time goes on, um, this might be their, their situation, especially now in this day and age with, with organizations like HBCU Pulse out there. But I had no idea what, what HBCU was, you know, to be honest, it wasn't something that, um, I was told I'm a first generation American. And so the college application process in general was a very entrepreneurial one to begin with. But especially at, you know, my high school that I went to, it wasn't something that people really talked about. It was more so kind of the the traditional PWIs and, you know, et cetera, institutions, which could be, I think, another topic in and of itself, why, um, you know, HBCUs are, are only promoted in certain areas and certain communities and, and at certain schools. But I went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill undergrad. So, um, you know, and that was also a shift, but UNC Chapel Hill was amazing. Um, um, and on top of that, I then received my MBA, Master's in Business Administration from Columbia University in New York. So it was, um, I think, my um, higher education experiences and obviously did, you know, study abroad programs in London, um, business school, for instance, as well. Um, so all of my experiences have been at either predominantly white institutions or state um, colleges and um, obviously the Ivy League education that I received as well. So no HBCUs, but definitely got love for for the folks that I've met that came out of there as well. We love to hear. We love to hear. So mm -hmm. let me ask you this. So I want to know about, you know, your experience at those institutions, because really, like, you know, we always especially like when you go to an institution that isn't considered like, oh, this is the Black Ivy League, or oh, this isn't like, because we always look at, oh, Howard, FAMU, a and because sure. those are the sure. ones that keep, keep getting shown, like Spelman, Morehouse, right? And those sure. schools are significant, but Fort Valley is significant. Albany State is significant. So I know at the conversations that I would have at Fort Valley is like, man, like, I wonder how it is at the Ivy League schools. I wonder how those mass comp programs are. I, I, wonder, I wonder how the Walker, the Walter Cronkite School at, at ASU is doing in Arizona. You know, I always used to wonder about that. So what was your college experience like? Like, was the coursework hard? Like, were you really, you know, prepared to get out there in the world and get a job? Like, how was that on campus? Yeah, I would say the coursework was pretty um, intensive and very focused. I would say, you know, I didn't necessarily, I'll speak to undergrad first. It wasn't a, a space where I felt like I was 
coached or mentored along the way. And I think part of that is because, again, more of a state school, very huge public university. And with that, you know, you're kind of finding your own way. And so it kind of breeds. If you aren't already a hustler, you definitely need to be one if you want to be successful and if you want to make the connect those dots in and of itself. So um, what I see from the outside looking in from HBCUs, it seems more of a like, you know, let's all get it together. No, I wouldn't say it was it was equally that at my undergrad. But what I would say, though, that they did have the the coursework and the notoriety um, that I felt like I needed to get to where I wanted to go, especially knowing that I didn't necessarily want to graduate and then just stay in North Carolina, right? I'm from New York originally. I wanted to go back to New York. <laughs> and so because of that, I knew, you know, majoring in a major and at a place where I feel like not only ranking, but also um, interests can be cross cross-fed at different places. So actually my start in media and entertainment didn't happen for me in undergrad. You know, I studied um, public health. I studied health policy and administration um, at UNC, but it's, I think, ranked number two um, in the country or so, at least at that time, uh, for for healthcare. And at first I thought I was going to be a healthcare administrator or potentially go to med school. And so that was, that was my decision-making process there. But, you know, quickly within those courses, which were tough, which were difficult, but also rich, really sparked to say, is this really an interest and passion of yours? I recognize that, you know what, the things that I was thinking of myself as hobbies, the more media and entertainment type of things that I was doing, whether with friends or family, I was realizing that I really wanted to more so be there. And it was and it was through college and through doing th those things that I realized, okay, I can actually make a career out of this. I don't necessarily want to switch my major and, 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 and stay for another year, take out more loans, et cetera. So I'm going to figure that out in the quote unquote real world. And, and that's what I did by graduating and going into consulting. Um, but the schoolwork, just to answer your question, the schoolwork was definitely very difficult. I think um, it was a it was a big sense of independence. I felt like um, you know a lot of things. If I didn't figure out the answer, I had to find a way to to do it. I had to get to know certain professors who who were helpful. But I um, I think to major in something like public health uh, was also very specific, and to have an entire school dedicated to that was was pretty incredible. So I do think they have a lot of great resources there as well. I love it. I love it. So you have had a very expansive media journey, even though you didn't major in media. You've had a, such an expansive media journey just of the, you know, the places that you worked and the things that you've done. You even worked for the WWE from what I saw. I was yeah. like, wow. As a wrestling fan, I'm like, wow. Like, we, 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 we in there. All right. We in there. We're it. <laughs> so, like, you know, you work so many amazing places. So, you know, what I want to know is, like, what is it like? in that corporate world because a lot of folks want to know if like you have to suppress yourself because because you know like a lot of us especially now in this generation you know we want to be black unapologetically and we want to be ourselves and we don't subscribe to the notion of code switching because yeah. we believe that we shouldn't dial ourselves down because what we are isn't bad you know so like what is it like in the modern day world in a corporate environment at these big huge fortune 500 companies Yes, I'm not a proponent of code switching at all, but I would say part of me and and my whole mindset is like sometimes you have to or most times you have to assimilate before you can dominate. So I do think at the first thing it's not going, you know, all black everything unless that's what the the time and the and the company calls for. I'm not saying change yourself, but for me, it was a journey to get to the place where I can now be and say, you know what, this is who I am, take it or leave it. And I think society needed to take a journey too to say, hey, I'm willing to accept you as, as you are. Because if I started, you know, in 2023, my first job, first corporate job, et cetera, yeah, go in as your unapologetic self because I think it's very much well appreciated. This was not the same environment 10 years ago, you know, when I first, first started. Um, and so at first I was nervous, you know, I, I felt like, again, not really having anyone to look up to, to say, oh, you, you came to corporate America and this is what you did. Like, and you look like me and, and et cetera. How can I, how can I navigate the space? Not really knowing who to ask. So I had to figure it out. And at first, you know, working in the corporate setting, I felt like, oh, I, I don't think I can do this until, you know, I think it was around a couple years in, it was actually my, my interview for, um, Apple, Apple TV, where 
it was my last interview. And I, at that point, was like wearing wigs. I just did my first big chop. And I was like, you know what? Oh, no. I think I need to go in here with this wig because I don't think for this, though, just for the interview, let's just have the, the standard look. Um, it's not only a big chop, but my hair was um, blonde at that point as well. And I was just thinking, you know what? I want them to focus on what I can do, what I can offer, not necessarily my aesthetic. And as I was thinking through that, I said, why, why would I? why would I change? And so I decided to take off my wig before I even showed up. And um, I did the final interview with my big shop, with my blonde, obviously got the position. But on top of it being just an amazing situation, it was really confirmation to me to say, no, you can show up as your full self in these big corporate environments. Apple is one of the top companies in the world. And for me to be able to do that there meant like I can do that anywhere. Um, and so since then, it was kind of like, no, this is who I need to be at all times. Um, and if if anything, it's it's this is our value add, not our only value, definitely not, but at least it is a value add that can't be necessarily transferred. You can't teach someone else to be black, <laughs> but you are and you, you have your own experience and it's it's up to you to really show show up and show these corporations that, you know, you are valuable. But I do say pace it and, and really read the room before you take over. I love that. So let's get into even more advice, you know, for black yeah. women in the corporate world, because we have a lot of black women, you know, that want to succeed in these environments and they have dreams of making it in the business world with their own businesses or becoming heads of businesses. Like I, had, I had a friend at Fort Valley that, you know, she did not want to start a business. And at that time, I did not understand it. However, I understand now that having faces in those places matters. You know, and I'm like, you know what? I, I think that that's powerful because although, you know, I want to be an entrepreneur and she wanted to be ahead of a Fortune 500 company. Like, I think that both of us are significant and important. So what is your advice to those black women that want to get in and succeed in a corporate world and environment? I, I love that you had that conversation with your friend, because I would say both um, are equally important. Not everyone has to have that um entrepreneurial bug. Not everyone has it, period, you know, and that's okay. Um, or if you do have it, maybe your your pathway is to be an entrepreneur. So kind of change things within your organization. So my main advice for black women wanting to succeed in, in the corporate environment is to really once just stay close to that dream. If that's truly it, then that it's okay to follow it, but also understand your why. Like, why is it that you want to succeed? You know, really, really be okay with that. If, if it's just because, hey, I want to, I want to be on the cover of Forbes one day, fine. If it's, if it's more so because you want to see the change that this organization can bring, fine. If you want to see more capital, if you want to bring more people up like you, whatever your reason is, I don't want to necessarily downplay that that is or is not enough. It's more so just having a clear understanding because if you don't know why you're doing something, your strategy is is all already off kilter and that means your actions your movements the way you interact with others within that corporation would not be effective because you don't even know what you're doing and and the real people who are also gunning for that position can sniff that out and 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 perhaps you know make make you question yourself um and so i i would definitely say just one again like know your why but also the other thing is really just to form some sort of support group inside and outside the organization it's definitely a long road you're not, you don't you're not going to get there tomorrow <laughs> or the day after tomorrow but if that's something that you want you you have the full capacity to get there but it's harder to do that solo it's really you know i wouldn't say all of your you know um your friends and your mentorship and your support should come from inside the company. No, because then that's a very insular way of viewing things. You can also gain experiences from your community outside. Like, you know, as you said, you were talking to your friend. That's that's already a community. Talk to people outside about what you're going through more often. A lot of times I would say, and, and myself included, I've been in situations where feeling like, you know, no one else would really understand this work life that I'm doing. It's so specific. Never mind. But there's a lot of core things that we as black women or we as black people overall go through in corporate America that other people can understand. And so be reaching out, obviously listening to shows like this, um, reaching out to to different folks and forming a community, some sort of support group would help you kind of um, think through things, strategize ways faster and just get get ahead a little bit more. So let's have the conversation that I love to have, which is about media and about stakeholders, because a lot of us want to be on air. Like a lot of us have this dream of either being on air or the radio, like how I did, uh, or being on TV. Of course, you know, when I was growing up, 
we saw the tail end of 106 in Park. Like, if you stop watching Power Rangers, you started watching, started getting into hip hop. So, you started <laughs> watching 106 Park after school because it, we, we didn't get to the beginning. We got a little bit of the end. Um, but, like, a lot of folks wanted to be on air because of that. And they saw 106 in Park. They saw TRL. They, they listened to the breakfast clubs and the different on air radio situations. But a lot of those opportunities aren't around anymore. So, when I talk to media students and aspiring on air personalities and journalists, what I say is that because of COVID and because of automation in the radio and TV industry, those opportunities aren't there anymore. And a lot of folks go to college, not just HBCUs, they go to college in general wanting to get in media to be on air. However, mm -hmm. we've seen programs rolled out where they we want to see like black folks that are heads of studios or that are executives. And it's more opportunities for that. So yeah. just for you, because you've seen both sides, because you don't air with Revolt, you, mm -hmm. you have an amazing YouTube channel, you do amazing content, but also you've been in that corporate world, you've been a deal maker, you facilitated things. So like, do you think that maybe it's time as we move forward for black students and black professionals to look more towards the executive suite or the C-suite versus just being on air? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it, it's a question of how much control do you do you want? kind of out the gate um, when it comes to your career. I do, and I am a huge proponent of more Black people just being in the corporate executive space. Um, not necessarily, I, that doesn't mean if your dream is to be on air, that's your dream, you know? Like, the, it's not for me to say don't do it, but I do think it's very important and it's, it's almost unfortunate when Black folks who have an idea of wanting to be on air, when they finally make that decision to say, oh, actually being an executive producer is pretty interesting or being, you know, you know, a deal maker is pretty interesting. And it's kind of like at that point, you're, you're either, you either have to be the best of the best when it comes to on air to then be able to make that transition or it's too late one overall. And then you're beholden to the folks who actually make those final decisions, AKA the, the studio heads, et cetera, et cetera. If you yourself was one, you at least at least for me, I've been able to just see the landscape a little differently. Um, that doesn't mean it's better or worse than folks who decided to go straight out the gate. I mean, we we kind of end up at a path that we're supposed to end up anyway, but I wouldn't change the way I did things. And I do encourage other people to do that as well. Like, you know, really look at the business for what it is, because I think people forget that it is a business just like any other business when they decide to say they want to be on air. And that means focusing on their all their attention on being talent on being a byproduct of a business versus being a part of the business themselves. Um, I think it's it's changing a lot more. You see it and, and people maybe need to give themselves more credit. It's changing a lot more in this industry where folks recognize the idea of ownership period. So you may have your own show that you own. You may have your own YouTube channel that you own. So that's a level of being you know a business owner. But I think when you think of the media industry overall and how much of a conglomerate a lot of these entities are, are are becoming. You see a lot of mergers happening between top companies. You got to think to yourself, like, what does that mean in terms of ownership, in terms of decision making, in terms of opportunities for you to really pursue that dream? And it's not to say that it won't happen, but it means to say you have to get a little more creative about how it happens for you. The same way that someone ended up on 106 and Park is not going to be the same way that they do on the 106 and Park of 2023. And that means you need to know this business a little bit more. Um, and the the check difference doesn't hurt either <laughs> between being an executive and 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 going the the on air on air route from from day one. And I, I want to just say this, like the 106 and Park, you got a 106 and Park. I, Terrence J got on there. He had, he had to go to New York and he didn't get it. He went to Atlanta. They said he looked real familiar. Like, <laughs> we should give him a shot as an intern. Like, it's a little bit different now. I don't, I don't know if some folks are willing to go that Terrence J route because that shows dedication. But there's not even those opportunities anymore That's it. because of That's just it. how media is consolidated now. Like how you said, media is consolidated. You have all these mergers going on because folks are losing a bunch of money and they're trying mm -hmm. to spin out of the game because they're in debt and losing billions of dollars. Like, And, and I yeah. think that that's what a lot of folks in, in media don't understand is that you have to, to read the room and you have to see the industry because that says a lot about what your job prospects are going to be. What do you think media is going to look like this year? 
Yeah, you know, um, we can make some predictions. I think one of which is that more entrants or more people, more more types of organizations would start to consider themselves a media company. You kind of see that happening already where, you know, you're not only competing from a media standpoint with with the Warner Brothers, with the, you know, um, NBC Universals of the world. You're also competing with the the meta slash Facebook, ByteDance slash TikTok. The, you know, it's, it's tech is already ingrained in media and I don't see, a, I can foresee a lot of under other industries having their own version of a media level platform because of how much we've seen social media for for instance democratize the the level of entrance that you can have uh, and the the opportunity to just be kind of a media company you yourself can pick up a phone and and get that llc and now you are a media company so there it's just there's a bunch there's just going to be a bunch of new entrants with that though i think the opportunities for for not only ad dollars, but just dollars in general, I think would really just like really depend on the economy. I feel like the opportunities for you yourself to to explore opportunities, to be on air, to to have shows that have that second, third, et cetera season, to have ad dollars super flowing in, it's really dependent on how loose a lot of these companies are, are willing to be despite an impending quote unquote recession. Who knows? I think that's another reason why we see a lot of shows kind of canceling Netflix as you said, opening up that ad window, a lot of players that wanted to enter media and entertainment are realizing just how hard it is um, to be um, in there and and recognizing that they still have to answer to shareholders and answering the shareholders. I mean, how can we get more innovative with our shows that we put out, which means every show has to be a success. And that also means that it may not be a lot of more on-air testing opportunities because folks are just recognizing how can we just spin something that's already great and, and make that a new entity of itself. I think when it comes to folks that want to be on air, folks that want to do on-air talent work, I think this year is a great year to try to do that on a more independent level, an entrepreneurial level. I feel like this year, as you've probably seen starting in COVID, the, the opportunities to just like get your own audience, to build your own brand is going to be exponential this year, you know, and I think a lot of people are going to tap in and, and really see the value of it because they're starting to see the effects of folks who started in COVID, who started X, X about a years ago and how they, how they are, are profiting right now, despite let's say the economy overall still being in a, in a flux. I love it. I love it. Like, I, I think this is an amazing conversation. I can talk about media all day and I've done it so many times before. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but we have to go on and go because I know that you have so many things that you're doing and that you're yeah. busy. So I, I want to end off with this. Like, where can we find you on social media? And I always ask this, like, how can we support you? Because following on social media ain't support. Like, you know, like <laughs> we have to actually tap in with you and see what we can do to support you, watch you and, and see you grow. So where can we find you on social media and how can we support you? Yeah, I appreciate that question. So you can find me on social media. All of it is the same. It's just my name at Akila Friend. That's A-K-I-L-A-H. F-F-R-I-E-N-D. How can you support me? I think, um, you know, I have a lot of things going on. Um, as you mentioned, uh, right now, one of the talk show hosts for Revolt TV's Black Girl Stuff. So you can tap in there every week. Um, also a podcast host for Revolt's um, podcast network. The show that I, I co-host is called Monuments to Me. Um, so on top of that, just tapping in by watching and supporting by watching, I am, as you mentioned, starting to do the whole, like, how do I do this and build this on my own? So that means the YouTube page. That means my blog. That means everything is at Akila Friend, but really tapping in, watching the videos, commenting, letting me know what you like, what you want to see. Um, my focus right now is media wellness and just the overall business lifestyle. So I'm just, I'm just ready to show more about black excellence every day, bring people around and create that community for myself and, and hopefully by support you just become a part of that i love it i love it we love to see it well akila thank you so much for coming on make sure to tap in with her we got to support black creatives and black folks making it happen but thank you so much for coming on akila you listen to hp pulse radio on sirius xm we'll be right back like what you hear uh, yeah subscribe to hbcu pulse radio on apple Podcasts, spotify or wherever you get your podcasts also head to hbcupulse.com to stay up to date on what's going on in the hbcu community thank, thank you, you for, for listening, listening to hbcu, HBCU pulse, pulse radio, radio.